I just want some time to focus on my transition. Hey, I am Chuck the Bureaucrat, and today I want to take a little bit of time and focus on your transition leave plan. You know, a couple weeks ago, I showed you the long and winding timeline that you have to thread your way through as part of your retirement process. And one of the things that I kind of glossed over was the leave plan. How are you going to organize your absences from work in a way that gets you the best outcome? Now, it's easy to assume that this will be a, a pretty simple part of the whole puzzle, but there's a couple of unusual things about leave that are relevant for retirees that they can trip us up. Either we end up accidentally wasting leave or we end up in some kind of bureaucratic gunfight over how a rule gets applied. So while I would love to just ask, what's your retirement date and what's your leave balance and hand you the simple one size fits all plan, as with a lot of stuff in your transition, there's going to be some assembly required. To get started, we are going to be spending a lot of time in Army Regulation 600-8-10 Leaves and Passes. Of course, we get this from the Army's official publication website, because pros don't Google government documents. And one of the reasons that this is important is because of that publication date on this reg. June 2020? I mean, that's kind of old for a reg that is as central as this one. So by using the Army's official website, we're able to confirm that this is, in fact, the correct version. And this is going to be really important later when we look at the 2024 Retirement Guide and we notice that there are some things that don't match. The other reason that looking at the official website is important is because of those two Army directives. Army directives change Army regulations, and when you've got a regulation as old as this one, it's a good idea to check to see if any of the things you care about have been changed by these directives. In this case, those Army directives are about pregnancy, parenthood, reproductive health, not really anything we care about as far as retirement. Okay, your leave plan is going to have to take into consideration at least six pieces. There's the usual leave that you earn and it, it shows up on your LES. This includes both the before leave that you start the fiscal year with and your earned leave that you're getting added on top at a rate of 2.5 days per month. Then there is your non-chargeable leave and this includes a, a whole bunch of excused absences that don't count against your earned leave. But for retirement purposes, we want to focus on three of them. Transition Administrative Absences, Involuntary Separation Administrative Absences, that's a terrible name, and the Career Skills Program. And you need to keep your eye on federal holidays, and you'll you know, really see why in a second. All right, first things first. You want to start developing your leave plan early in the last full fiscal year that you're going to be serving. A lot of you are probably like I was, where you hoard leave just in case you ever need it. But having a large volume of leave can actually force you into a situation where you have to sell your leave. In fact, this is such an important point that AR 600-8-10 specifically addresses this. But they don't tell you why this is important. Obviously, if you enter the new fiscal year with more earned leave days than you have left to serve, well, that's going to be a problem. Let's say you're retiring on November 1st and you have a, a before balance on your LES of 45 days on the 1st of October. There's just not enough days left in your military career to use all that leave. But there's something else that gets overlooked when people make their plan. They are going to earn an additional 2.5 days of leave every month in that retirement year. So if you think about the guy who's retiring on November 1st, he has to get his leave down to 28 days before the end of the fiscal year. 
And that's assuming that he's going to be on terminal leave on the 1st of October and not take advantage of like the federal holidays or any non-chargeable leave in that last month. The same thing goes if you're retiring on the 1st of December, and if you have any special leave accrual, it also applies to January. And remember, these numbers are maximums. In a little bit, I'm going to make an argument that you really don't want to be on terminal leave for months and months. And there's this other nuance about earned leave that gets injected into this situation, and that is that you are earning leave every day you serve. What that means for the guy who's retiring on the 1st of November is that he pretty much has to take at least some portion of terminal leave right at the end of October, or he risks having to sell back some of his leave. The next thing I want to talk about are federal holidays, and really there's two reasons I bring this up. Number one, I don't like taking leave when I wouldn't normally be working. It's better than selling your leave, but only just. Personally, I was on terminal leave from the middle of December all the way to the end of February, and every time a federal holiday came up, it just, just bugged me. But the second important thing here is that you, you really don't want to be trying to clear post around federal holidays. That can complicate those checklists that they want you to collect all those signatures for. With this in mind, I recommend that you really want your last two weeks on active duty to be timed so it lands on two weeks that don't have any federal holidays. All right, now let's talk about transition administrative assistance, involuntary separation administrative assistance, and the career skill program. And just so you know, as we go into this, this is kind of muddy ground. I'll show some examples of conflicting guidance, and there is just enough ambiguity in the reg that you might find yourself in a, a pencil measuring contest, if you know what I mean. With that potential for bureaucratic wrangling on your horizon, I want to point out some specific things in the regulations text that might come in handy when you have to deal with your first sergeant. The non-chargeable leaves and absences are covered in Chapter 5 of Army Regulation 600-8-10, the same one we've been working on the whole time. And right off the bat, there's a list of categories in Chapter 5-1B. Quick look shows that there is no mention of retirement here. So your boss just slaps the regulation shut and says, ah, you're not eligible for any of this. But look what it says about in addition to those in paragraph 5-12. That is where these retirement absences live. First, let's talk about Transition Administrative Absences, TAA. As you build your leave plan, I recommend that you attempt to take your TAA as early in the process as possible. You'll notice in the underlined portions that this absence is for pre-separation job interviews and house hunting. If you wait until the very end of your leave plan to use your TAA, you might find that you've disqualified yourself because you got a job and you no longer need to look for a house. You see, TAA is an authorization. It's not an entitlement. So your command can say no, and in fact, you'll find a lot of leaders who are looking for reasons to do just that. That's the other thing about TAA. While the regulation clearly allows retiring soldiers to use it, a lot of bosses will just sort of ignore that red highlighted portion. Or they'll argue that since this is for soldiers who are involuntarily separated, it is only for soldiers who are involuntarily retired. One of the nice things about the way this text is written out is that it specifies that it applies to soldiers retiring from active duty. There's a couple of other places that are more ambiguous about this point. Now, just because ain't nothing easy, there is a little problem here. It starts with the fact that in the paragraph about TAA, there's no stated limit on how much a soldier can use. But in the 2024 Retirement Planning Guide, it says that commanders can authorize up to 20 days of TAA for CONUS soldiers, 
and up to 30 for Oconus soldiers. But the planning guide is not exactly correct. You are entitled to those numbers of days, but in order to get them, your command has to authorize both TAA and something called involuntary separation administrative absences. And if you thought that your command was resistant to TAA, wait till you meet ISSA. This is all clearly laid out in the subparagraph that follows TAA. And while I would argue that the title is misleading, it's important to notice that the text clearly states that this is for soldiers who are retiring from active duty. And if you read down a little further, you'll see where those limits of 20 days for CONUS and 30 days for OCONUS actually come from. Now, before I get off this whole topic of TAA and ISSA, I want to talk about a couple of funny little points that get laid out in paragraph 5-13. By the way, this paragraph has that terrible involuntary separation and retirement ambiguity about it. First, you can take TAA and ISSA as a series of trips, but if you do that, a duty day must be worked between each absence. At least in my command, that was interpreted as a work day, not a weekend and not a federal holiday. What that means is that if you use your TAA and ISSA as a series of trips, that 20 days can quickly balloon from almost three weeks to five weeks. Also, you can take TAA and ISSA as a single block, and you can do it in conjunction with your terminal leave, but you can't do it in conjunction with ordinary leave. And while the reg says you can take terminal leave followed by TAA and ISSA, as I discussed earlier, uh, I, th I think that's a problem. All right, we have one last type of non-chargeable leave to talk about, and then I promise we're going to put this all together. For this, we're back up in paragraph 5-12 in subparagraph C14, the Career Skills Program. I'm going to hit this one fast by making the point that you should not get too enraptured by that phrase, not to exceed 180 days. Because see that reference to AR 600-81? Well, way down in paragraph 8-2, subparagraph C1. It says that soldiers are not eligible for the career skills program until they are within 180 days of the end of their terminal leave. So that 180 days in the regulation on leaves and passes, uh, it's kind of a theoretical maximum because you still have to out process before your retirement date. Now, the retirement guide makes a really strange comment about no more than 120 days. And while I can't duplicate the math that the retirement guide used, it seems like what they're really saying is that once you clear post and you take ISSA and you take TAA and you take your leave, you would be hard pressed to get more than 120 days in the career skill program. All right. That's a lot of text and we're done. And hopefully you see why you might want to have a bureaucrat on your side for this whole transition. But let's go back to my initial point. You need to start laying out your plan somewhere around 18 to 24 months before your actual retirement date. And it's a good idea to figure out what the major, I don't know, rocks are in this whole plan. You want to plan the important stuff, and then you want to plan the details around that. And let me just say that a long terminal leave is probably not the best idea. Terminal leave in and of itself is not an important issue, but I argue that there are three other ones. Number one, your family. I'm telling you, two weeks after you retire, the Army will have gone rolling along and it'll be fine without you. But your spouse, your kids, the old folks, they're still around. And you're finally at a point in your life where you can start to invest time heavily into those relationships. So if you're going to move to a new city, you might want to time that so that it's really low stress on the family. You might want to take a nice long trip. And I would submit that doing this 
well before you get into the throes of your transition is beneficial. You draw down your leave balance, your command comes to grips with the idea that you are leaving, and it frees you up as you get closer to that frantic and chaotic end. Number two is your VA claim. Remember that the Transition Assistance Program is designed to make sure that you complete the administrative tasks that DOD cares about, not necessarily the tasks that a retiring service member cares about. And there can be a bit of a traffic jam between the Department of Defense and the VA. The VA wants to get retiring service members their ratings before they retire. That's the benefits delivered by discharge program. But that means that your VA claim has to be submitted like 120 to 90 days before your retirement date. And the VA is going to try to schedule a whole bunch of doctor's appointments in those last 90 days. And they're not going to be particularly flexible about dates. So I would argue that you, you might not want a lot of terminal leave in those last 90 days. I mean, you certainly wouldn't want a 32-day trip to Sicily. And finally, number three of the big rocks that you got to put into your leave plan is when are you going to clear post? Hint, hint, avoid federal holidays. From there, start mixing and matching some pieces. Experiment with different timelines. New stuff is gonna crop up because it always does. And if you wanna get ahead of that, watch this video.